as we have seen already in Matthew chapter 9, the scribes and Pharisees were pretty much fed up with Jesus. Uh, he paid no attention to the oral traditions and scribal law that they were so attached to. And it was most difficult, especially for them, to watch him fellowship with tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus clearly was placing people at a crossroads of either accepting him or rejecting him, uh, of loving him or hating him. In today's text, we see that the negativity of these scribes and Pharisees toward Jesus had reached yet another level. Matthew chapter 9, verse 32 is where we begin today. As they went out, behold, they brought to him a man, mute and demon-possessed. And when the demon was cast out, the mute spoke, and the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never seen like this in Israel. Now Isaiah predicted that the blind and the lame and the deaf and the mute would be healed when the Messiah would come. Isaiah 35, beginning at verse 5, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing, for water shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Now, when I was 22 years old, I went on a short-term missions trip to South America. And we had a marvelous experience there. I saw people being healed and saw people come to the Lord just by playing a recording of the gospel. And then I had learned to ask them if they'd like to receive Jesus, uh, to ask them that in Spanish. Uh, and so I was amazed that it seemed like the majority of people we witnessed to were opening their hearts to Christ. And so that was a tremendous experience. But there, was a, there were some of our team members who prayed one day for a, an eight-year-old boy who was deaf and mute, and he was healed that day. And that evening in the city park, thousands of people, many of who had heard about this little boy's healing, thousands came to the park, and, and hundreds and hundreds of people gave their hearts to Christ. And so there's an example of how the Messiah is still doing this today. Christ is still at work today, and we don't want to to fall into that trap that some have fallen into that say, well, these works of Christ are no longer happening today. But indeed they are. Uh, the Messianic ministry of Christ Jesus continues today through his followers. In verse 34, but the Pharisees said, he cast out demons by the ruler of the demons. Now the ruler of the demons is of course Satan or the devil. And the Jews also referred to the ruler of the demons as Beelzebub, and later on they'll refer to him as that, and meaning the Lord of the Flies. And this was also a reference to the false god of the Canaanites. When people refuse to admit things are wrong, which is what these scribes and Pharisees were doing, uh, then wrongs and evil ways are multiplied. It doesn't get better. It gets worse. And so uh, that's what was happening here. They used Jesus as a scapegoat for their wrongs and their own misguided views. In other words, if he does not agree with us, then he must be of the devil. Uh, these guys had to raise a, a heavy-hitting weapon against Jesus. And that's when they, they brought the devil into the whole scheme of things and their criticisms of Jesus. Uh, so they, it is interesting that they fulfilled what devil means themselves by slandering Jesus because the meaning of devil is a slanderer or a false accuser. And so they were fulfilling the works of the devil themselves. Later in chapter 12, this accusation is repeated and expanded upon. And so we'll save any more, uh, you know, talking about that until we get to chapter 12. Verse 35. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So we are reminded here that Jesus' foremost ministry was that of teaching about the kingdom of heaven. Jesus had great concern 
that people's lives could be so much better if they could live them according to the will of God, according to the ways of God. And the kingdom of heaven teaching that he did was describing to people a better way to live, a better way to relate, and how to function according to God's plan. And a lot of that was given to us in the Sermon on the Mount, which we spent a lot of time in. Uh, And so, you know, living according to the kingdom of heaven was the greatest intent of his ministry, teaching about that and preaching about that. Now, then we see that Jesus saw the brokenness and the weariness of the people and with, and with his compassion wanted to make them whole. Uh, he uses two images to describe uh, what he saw in people gathering around him. First of all, he saw them as weary and scattered sheep without a shepherd. Uh, they were spiritually hungry and thirsty like sheep that had no pasture in which to eat or water to drink. And so he saw the people through eyes of compassion. The Jewish leadership failed to shepherd God's people. He saw the people as sheep without a shepherd, without any legitimate spiritual leadership in their lives. They were just kind of left to, you know, scrounge around and get whatever they could come up with, you know. And so Jesus wanted to feed them spiritually as well as he did. We know he actually fed them uh, physically too. But he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. Now, secondly, Jesus saw them as a crop that was ripened and ready for harvest. All of this is in stark contrast to how the scribes and Pharisees saw the common people of the land. They saw these folk as religiously incompetent, and especially the people of Galilee. Instead of a ripe harvest, they saw the people as nothing more than chaff. Uh, not fit for harvest. Chaff is, was weeds that grew in um, among the, the wheat. And then at, at harvest time, the, the, the chaff would be uh, winnowed out. And it would be blown away by the wind or it would be gathered up and burned. And so that's kind of the way they saw the people of the land. They were the harvest themselves, they believed. And so they did not see the people the same way Jesus saw them. And so there's a great difference there. So the question comes to all of us today... How do we see the people around us? Do we see them with the compassionate heart of a shepherd gathering hungry, weary, scattered sheep? Or do we see them as throwaway people because they have so many problems? You know, when we hosted the six homeless men this past Sunday night, it was so clear that they were very real people with very real problems. And you know, I was one of the things that amazed me about this group of guys is that they openly were willing to talk to us uh, about the, their lives. Uh, and they did not hold back. You know, they, I think they did that because they trusted due to the love that we were showing to them. And they, they didn't have any reason not to express their needs. Uh, and so they were, we were able to minister to them more effectively, perhaps, because of that. But they were also so clearly grateful for the way in which our folk treated them as if they were the most special people in town. Jesus was saying these things to remind his followers of how the righteousness, uh, their righteousness, the disciples' righteousness needed to exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. They were called to minister healing and hope to broken and hopeless people. Now, Jesus said that the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. So his followers are to see themselves as laborers bringing in a harvest. And of course, the laborers would be multiplied many, many times over. Uh, Even in that first century, thousands and thousands of new laborers would be going out into the harvest, uh, following these disciples, as and Jesus would multiply his ministry in the world through them. Now we move into Matthew chapter 10, where Jesus does some specific training of his disciples. And what I want you to understand here is that the training Jesus did for these 12 disciples, we are part of that training. And that's, these verses are in here for a reason, and that's to train us how to walk out our walk with God, our walk with Christ, in much the same way that they were taught to do. So put yourself in that gathering of disciples that were around Jesus that day. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Now note here that Jesus called his disciples to him. 
Now that particular expression means that him being their leader, their, their teacher, he was calling them to him to say something specific to them. They knew they were about to receive instruction. So that was something they understood. That's what that, that word call meant. I'm calling you here for, to, for me to, to mentor you and to teach you something. And then we find here also that he was sending them out. Uh, and so our service to the Lord as well is at his calling and direction. The word power here may not be the best translation uh, to help us understand what Jesus delegated to these disciples. The Greek word is exousia, which means an ability, a capacity to do something. Uh, the idea this word carries is, is like a king who has, is granting permission uh, to someone under his authority to do something in his behalf, in his name, and also with his resources. And so it's like an ambassador of the king uh, being sent out. So please understand that the authority that they were given is, is the Lord's authority. And we must depend on him to give his ability to us to do his works. Spiritual gifts work in much the same way. Uh, when, when we are gifted by the Holy Spirit to minister in some way, it's not our abilities you know, that we do that in. But it's an, the, these are abilities that the Holy Spirit provides to us. And the scripture says he distributes those as he wills. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are diversities of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. Then listen to verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 12. But one in the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. And so it's not up to us to manufacture something, you know, but to be ready when the Lord wills us to do something. Uh, you know, it's a, um, I knew the very day that Roy Carter stepped in my office and began to talk about the Room in the Inn Winter Ministry that we were supposed to be involved in it. You know, it's like the Holy Spirit said, okay, this is what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, and then I spoke to some others. And then, of course, leadership began to rise up. And before you know it, we have probably close to 30 people altogether who have volunteered to serve in this ministry. And, and that's showing you that the Lord's behind it. And he's willed it. And he's given the abilities to accomplish it. And to, he's revealing his plan in the whole thing. And it's beautiful to watch that happen. Now, in verse 2 we see where the disciples are named or they're called apostles here. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these. First Simon, who is called Peter and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Lebius, whose surname was Thaddeus, uh, Simon, the Canaanite and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Now, the 12 disciples are called apostles here. And why are they called apostles? It's because an apostle is one who is commissioned and sent out on behalf of the king. Uh, and in verse 1, Jesus sent them out. Now, the Holman Bible Dictionary tells us uh, about the number 12. It's interesting. The number 12 is quite prominent in Scripture, just as the number 7 is. Uh, but the, uh, the Sumerians used 12 as one base for their number system. The calendar reflects the 12 base number system, as we know. Uh, the tribes of Israel and Jesus' disciples were 12 in number. Uh, the importance of the number 12 is evident in the effort to maintain that number when Levi ceased to be referred to as one of the tribes because they had a priestly role in, the, in, in Israel. Uh, the Joseph tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh, were counted separately to keep the number at 12. Uh, and when, the, when Judas Iscariot died, the disciples were very quick to replace him because they somehow felt like the number needed to remain at 12. And so 12 has seemed to be especially significant also in the book of Revelation when we studied through that, if you'll remember. Uh, the, the New Jerusalem has seven or 12 gates. It's a wall, it has walls that, with 12 foundations. And the tree of life yielded 12 kinds of fruit. So it's also at the age of 12 that Jesus uh, showed up in the temple. Uh, and then declared to his parents that he must be about his father's business. So the number 12 just constantly shows up there. And so Jesus initially had 12 disciples. Now, we are tempted to think that these guys 
of these guys as being the cream of the crop. You know, Jesus scanned everybody in his audience, you know, and he's saying, you know, I think or did he had interviews or auditions maybe to be his disciples. You know, he must have chosen the best, the best of the best. Uh, but I don't think that's true. Uh, Gail Irwin, he says, you know, we think of them as the apostles, but maybe they were really the B-apostles if you think about it, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, these guys were not at all likely to succeed based upon the external evidence about their lives. Simon, who was later, of course, called Peter, but Simon heads up the list. Uh, the name in the Greek means flat-nosed, and, and uh, uh, I don't know if he had a flat nose or not, but uh, John Corson says it also means shifting sands. And we know that Peter was impulsive and always speaking without thinking. He was also somewhat unteachable as he found reason to argue with Jesus on a few occasions. Uh, sometimes Peter had uh, just foot and mouth disease. Uh, and some of us may be a lot like Simon, you know, at times. Uh, Andrew was Peter's brother. And it, it seemed like he was always in Peter's shadow. There may be some here who feel like you're always in someone else's shadow. Uh, there was James and John, known as the Sons of Thunder. Why were they called that? I think it's because they had a hot temper, you know. And this was proven because they, uh, you know, they were, are the ones who wanted to call fire down from heaven and destroy all the Samaritans that had rejected hos giving them hospitality. They may have had a problem with anger to declare they wanted to, uh, God to, to just do a homicidal act on those people. Uh, so... Uh, some of us may have anger issues at times that Jesus need, needs to remove. Uh, Bartholomew was also called Nathaniel. You remember he was skeptical when he first heard about Jesus of Nazareth. He said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? So he had some prejudice to deal with in his life. Uh, Thomas appeared to be a cynic or a doubter. Matthew was a tax collector. Of course, we know about that. He spent his early adult life filled with greed and ripping off people uh, for his own gain. And... And then the second James listed here is really unknown. Nothing's ever said about him. He must have been a very quiet man. And some of us are quiet people and somewhat anonymous like, like James. Then there was Simon the Canaanite. He was also called Simon the Zealot. Uh, this means he was anti-government. Uh, anybody here anti-government? You know. <laughs> Uh, many of the zealots were like ultra-nationalist, maybe a little bit like the Zionist of the previous century, you know. Uh, and uh, Simon would have hated Matthew, the tax collector, because he worked for Rome uh, before they became followers of Jesus. And in fact, uh, oftentimes these, these zealots, they, might, they were not, uh, you know, opposed to just uh, sticking a knife in the side of one of those guys, you know. And they might have even carried out a number of assassins among the Romans. I worked did the work of an assassin among the, the Romans. And so that's the kind of guy Simon was, you know. That the point is, they had one thing in common, Jesus changed their lives. But the point is, too, for us, you might be thinking, you know, how can I serve the Lord? You know, what could God do with me? You know, look at me. I've got all these issues, you know. I've got, I mean, I'm a, you know, I, I'm, I'm a nobody or whatever. Or I'm too quiet to serve the Lord or whatever. I want to tell you that if these guys could be used by Jesus to impact the world the way they did, you can be used by the Lord too. And so don't discount yourself. You don't have to be a professional clergyman to serve the Lord, you know. And uh, in fact, I think there are a lot of people who are probably more effective at it than most of us preachers. So, uh, so anyways, uh, just, just keep in mind that Jesus uses all kinds of people from all kinds of backgrounds with all kinds of weaknesses and struggles and he transforms them to be his disciples. Now, verse 5 tells us, These twelve Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Jesus tells his disciples to start at home. Uh, the lost sheep of the house of Israel were the tax collectors, the sinners, the lepers, the demon-possessed, and blind and deaf, and broken-hearted among the common people of Israel. And so he says, go to those people just like I'm doing. He was doing that among those people, the lost sheep. Uh, and uh, they were referred to as lost sheep, again, because they had been neglected and spiritually abused and rejected by the religious leadership. Jesus wanted his disciples to have compassion 
on these lost sheep without a shepherd, just as he had compassion toward them. Now, they would eventually go to Samaria. They were not to start in Samaria, but they would eventually go to Samaria, uh, and they would go into the uttermost parts of the world. Uh, in fact, Jesus promised them that when the Holy Spirit came upon them, they would start in Jerusalem, and then in Judea, and then in Samaria, and then they would actually be empowered and enabled by the Holy Spirit to carry a witness about him throughout the world. And that's exactly what happened. Read the book of Acts and how exciting it is to see the way, the way all that happened over that next 30 years uh, after the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples. Uh, tremendous things happened throughout the world because of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. In verse 7, he says, And as you go, preach. That simply means publish or proclaim saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Again, we see that the greatest priority is to be given to teach, preaching and teaching uh, concerning the kingdom of heaven. They would repeat to others what they had heard Jesus teach about the kingdom of heaven. Uh, now, all of us have just gone through a lot of teaching about the kingdom of heaven in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we should all be somewhat equipped to be talking to people out in the world about what we've learned, right? Yeah. And you never know who's willing to listen to that and to hear what Jesus said concerning the kingdom. And so uh, we are able to do the same thing that these disciples were doing. Verse 8, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Now, I think the emphasis here is not just on what they were doing, but the attitude of their hearts and what they were doing. They were to do it freely. They weren't to charge people. Uh, for the ministry that Jesus sent them out into to the world to do. Uh, and uh, they before ministering, they did not stop and give an appeal for money. You know, you don't have to. I, mean, I remember watching TV a few years ago, and this TV evangelist was saying, if you will send me X amount of money, the Lord will bless you. You know, and, and your healing is being held back because you haven't sent any money in yet. You know, and that kind of thing. Well, how unchristlike. And how unlike his teaching that is. So that's, it's not about freely give it. Uh, so they were to minister without asking for money. Verse 9, provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money ba belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs, for a worker is worthy of his food. So Jesus told them to pack lightly, to keep it simple. Uh, in ministry, the burden of too much stuff... Uh, can slow us down and distract us from the main thing we are supposed to be doing. Uh, sometimes we can't get freed up to serve the Lord because we have so much entanglement with things. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes when Vicki and I would pack, a, and we still to this day, we still do this, we pack for a five-day vacation trip, and you'd think we were going to be gone for a month, you know. And it... And we, and we get to the to the where we're going, and we realize we don't need two thirds of this stuff, you know. So what do we think is going to happen? You're going to have to, you know, is there going to be a a threat to our? <laughs> although we did get stuck in a uh, in a hurricane situation one time down in Florida, you know, where all we had to eat was uh, peanut butter and crackers, you know, for a while. And so, uh, you know, it could be, could be a good idea to carry a little extra food with you in, uh, when you go on vacation. But. Uh, uh, <laughs> You know, but so much entanglement, so many extra things weighing us down and holding us back. So uh, it was a chore to pack it up again. Now, Jesus knew that people along the way would be available uh, to give them hospitality. And they needed to understand the principle that where God guides, God provides. Uh, and God will open up doors for us as we go. And I can tell you many stories about how this has been true in my own life, but it would just take too long to share that this morning. Uh, but I've, I've witnessed this very thing happen as I've gone out to do what Jesus had asked me to do somewhere. Uh, verse 11. In whatever city or town you enter, inquire who in it is worthy and stay there till you go out. And when you go into a household, greet it. If the household is worthy, let your peace be upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whoever will not receive you nor hear your words, that when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that city. 
Now, the word worthy here means um, suitable. People who are suitable to give you hospitality, people who understand what you're doing, seek out those who believe in what you are doing. Uh, and when he says to stay with, then he says to stay with those people. They were to remain in a place of opportunity and fruitfulness. On the other hand, if they, they were not to remain in a place that rejected their ministry, uh, where they were not welcomed, that would be a waste of time and would stir up all kinds of frustrations for them. So you stay in place when the Lord clearly is showing, you know, by the circumstances that it's a good place to stay. But if people reject what you're doing, don't linger there. You know, move on to somebody who is in interested in hearing the gospel. Verse 16. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Uh, but beware of men, for they will deliver you to the councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. Now, it seems pretty clear that the wolves Jesus spoke about at this time were the same scribes and Pharisees that were so hostile toward him. Luke's account says that they were lying in wait for him, just like a wolf. They were lying in wait for him, seeking to catch him in something he might say that they might accuse him. Now, Jesus said one time that he trusted no man because he knew what was in men's hearts. And so we are to be wise as serpents, uh, but yet innocent as a dove. Uh, being wise as a serpent means that they would need to be cautious in engaging with these religious wolves. Even today in, in Israel, and I suppose in other parts of the world too, the ultra-Orthodox Jews are very, they, they persecute Christians severely. And they would be kind of along the same lines as these Pharisees in Jesus' day who were persecuting him. And so we see that that goes on even today. Uh, the followers of Jesus would be severely persecuted, but there was no need to, to aggressively invite it. Now, you know, sometimes us guys, especially, I think we go, you know, bring it on, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> no, Jesus is saying, don't say that. Don't act like that. Don't invite persecution, you know. Don't aggressively, you know, challenge these guys. Uh, it might even shorten your time of ministry, you know. So don't do not do that. Be as wise as a servant. Uh, they were called to minister to lost sheep, not to needlessly engage with wolves. Jesus said they were should remain innocent as doves. Now, guys, when we engage difficult people, hostile people, we are vulnerable to losing our tenderheartedness. Uh, you know, we get angry too, don't we? And we want to just challenge them back and fight, you know, for things. And, and, you know, we become, we lose our tenderheartedness. We become angry. We do not want as followers of Jesus Christ to present to the world the image of angry Christians. You know, we want to be, have the image of Jesus Christ full of compassion, full of love, full of grace, and full of the good news of why he came. And I, I, I really get concerned when I see Christians on TV being interviewed and they're, they're so angry, you know, all the time. You know, we are not to present that kind of view to the world. Uh, innocent means both harmless and simple. It means uh, don't complicate your mission with, uh, by going to battle with the wolves in your lives. It's better to avoid them, not losing sight of the goal. Uh, and... Even at that, trouble will inevitably come and they will be mistreated in the synagogues and brought before governing authorities because of their witness for Christ. Uh, I think we're going to see this happening with Christians in the modern era today. Uh, we're going in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, we're going to see Christians who will be persecuted because they are proclaiming, doing nothing more than doing good and proclaiming the gospel. And uh, even at this time, there are places in Europe where people can be arrested for witnessing about their faith, even in their own place of business. And I think that's what we're moving toward today. So we might uh, 
pay close attention to the words of Jesus in this passage. Uh, when this would happen to the disciples, though, it could open up a door of testimony. He says, don't invite it to happen. Don't do something rash. Don't fight back. Don't get, you know, shake your fist in people's faces or anything. Don't do those kind of things. But it's going to happen to you anyways. You're going to be persecuted for righteousness sake. He repeats that over and over. Uh, so it was going to happen, but it would open up a door for them to proclaim the gospel. That's a better choice than fighting, Right. He said, but when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak, for it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. So in Acts chapter 21, Paul, the Apostle Paul, he chose to go to Jerusalem, even though he had been warned that it might not be too safe for him there. He went to Jerusalem and to the temple where there was much hostility toward him, and he was taken into protective custody by a Roman commander in order to keep the mob from killing him. Here's what Paul did. He turned to that commander and he said, Would you ask everyone to be quiet? Because I have something I want to say. And what did he say? He gave his testimony. He went all the way back to when he was persecuting Christians, rounding them up. Many of them would die at his hand. He, and he went all the way back to that. And he said, on that road to Damascus where I was going to round these Christians up, I met Jesus. <laughs> and he changed my life. Uh, and I'm sure it got real quiet then. you know. And, but there was a point there where the crowd just went crazy. And were about to seek to kill him again. And the commander had to take him out and put him into hiding. Uh, and... And they were going to punish him by scourging. Wrong. The Roman centurion uh, that this commander served under had ordered his scourging. And uh, then Paul, of course, spoke up and said, Now, oh, wait a minute. Guess what? I'm a Roman citizen. And, uh, and the commander said, Well, I bought my citizenship. And Paul said, I didn't buy mine. I was born a Roman. <laughs> you know, he's a Jew, but he was also a Roman citizen. And the centurion said, Back off. <laughs> You're not allowed to scourge a Roman citizen. And so over and over in the next few weeks and months, Paul had opportunities to give his witness, his testimony. You remember the testimony he gave to King Agrippa, you know, before he was taken off to Rome as a prisoner. Then the shipwreck on the island of Malta. What happened there? Well, everybody gained great respect for him because of his attitude, his character, and how nice he was even to his captors. Listen, listen to this. Even those people that rounded him up, you know, were carrying him off to be to stand before Caesar. Uh, he was nice to those guys. And he, he spoke a word of testimony to them. And then he preached to the people on the island of Malta about Jesus Christ. Eventually he made it to Rome. And what did he do? Well, he's under house arrest. And while he was under house arrest, his guards would come to know Jesus. And they were, the, they were the emperor's guards. They were Caesar's guards. And what would they do? They would take the gospel into the middle, the very middle of Caesar's own household. Uh, where they would give testimony then of Jesus Christ. You see how this works? Yeah. Paul gave good news, not bad news. And what are the words of our mouth? And I just want us to consider this, you know, that our mission is to give testimony of Jesus Christ to the lost sheep in our world, uh, that he is there to help them and to be their Lord. So what we can see here is that God can take a hostile situation and turn it into an opportunity for the gospel. The gospel is what the world needs. You know what? We can come up with all kinds of other solutions it's never worked it's the gospel of Jesus Christ the transforming power of God's grace that makes the difference in our world so today what have we seen we have seen a stark contrast between how Jesus saw the common people of the land and how the scribes and Pharisees saw them the people were like sheep without a shepherd Jesus had compassion on them and saw that they were like a crop ready for harvest. The scribes and Pharisees saw the people like chaff to be rejected and thrown away. 
As followers of Jesus, we, like the disciples, are called to go out into the harvest and assertively express the compassion of Christ uh, to the, the lost sheep and gather in this harvest that is ripe and ready. Picture us again being with Jesus that day when he called the disciples in. Come on in, guys. I'm getting ready to send you out on your first missionary trip. <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, I, we do a lot of, we've done a lot of missionary trips out of this church over the years. But every time we step out into the world, it's a missionary trip. You know, every time we go out into our community, it's a missionary trip. Let's remember that that's our mission is to go out, proclaim the kingdom of heaven through Christ and have compassion on broken people and hopeless people who, who need help, who need healing in their lives. How many of you work, spend time around, go to school with or whatever with people who are hurting? Just raise your hand. How many of you know people who are hurting? What would happen if you said to one of those people, you know, I, I know you're hurting. I've heard about how you're hurting. And I don't want to push this on you, but I would be more than glad to pray for you. For God to help you with your problems. You know, what would happen? Are we afraid to do that? Well, remember, it's not our ability that causes something good to happen. It's the ability of Christ that he has given to us. It's not in us, but it's in him. And so... He gave, Jesus gave his disciples abilities for compassionate ministries. They were empowered to teach others about the kingdom of heaven, to bring hope to the hopeless, and to gather lost sheep. Now, having a study about the teachings of Jesus with people, that's an idea. Have you thought about that? I know of some people in our congregation that have a little study with people they work with. Sometimes at lunchtime or before work begins, early in the morning. Uh, and Or what about... Uh, listening to as we said and praying with people in trouble and proclaiming God's forgiving love to people who have lots of regrets about their lives you know there are people who don't think they can be forgiven for things they've done the shameful things they've done but you be the one to proclaim to them there is forgiveness because of what Christ has done his grace toward you proclaim forgiveness to those who have regrets that's the way we labor in the harvest Right there. What the Lord is looking for us, guys, is not ability, but availability. The Holy Spirit of Christ is within us to provide the ability. It's not us. It's his ability working in us. Jesus said, pray for laborers who are willing to gather in this ripe harvest. Is the harvest ripe today? Is it? Of course it is just as ripe as it ever was and so we are going to go out and reap the harvest amen let's do it stand with us mm -hmm.